It was a birthday party for some cousins. He was four. I was 29 or 30. The invitation said, dress like a superhero. (laughs) Challenge accepted. Brooke's like, I think they're talking just to the kids. I said, honey, you tell me all the time you married a child. That's what she says. That's what she says. So I've got a Batman costume. If you've ever seen the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy, you know that Christian Bale is his Batman. Talks like this. So I refused to talk any other way while I was in costume. <clears throat> Brooke got really annoyed with me when we went through the Taco Bell drive through I want three soft tacos. I'm like, sir? Yes. And lots of hot sauce. <laughs> okay, sir. I think it made a lot more sense when I pulled up to the window. Brooke hit her head in shame. But during the party, it was held at the nephew's house or the cousin's house. I'm not even sure what they are. It's one of those situations. There's something. I don't know. But we were at the party. We're family. They wanted to play hide-and-seek. There's part of me that doesn't like to play games, with kids especially, because there's a part of me that doesn't like to lose. And so when there's an invitation to play hide-and-seek with a bunch of little kids, game on. Because I'm going to get to go be in solace for a really long time. I will find a corner of this house the homeowners don't know exist, and I will come out in three hours and remind you all I was at the party. The only problem is when you play hide-and-seek with three-year-olds. Now, if you've ever tried to play hide-and-go-seek with a three-year-old, you know my pain. And if you haven't, thank the Lord right now that you are blessed and highly favored. And never, ever, ever, if you're competitive, play hide-and-seek with three-year-olds because they want to go with you every step of the way. And I look at them, and I'm like, quit following me. And Brooke shoots me this look. Brooke's my wife. She shoots me this look like, they will follow you if they want to follow you. And I shoot her back a look, I am Batman. <laughs> Leave me alone, kids. Which somehow in their minds turned into an invitation to follow me even more closely. And not only do they follow me, I found a spot behind a couch that was angled and we could have all hidden back there and positioned blankets on top of our heads and been gone for a really long time. They like to talk every step of the way, like really loudly, like you guys are going to make horrible spies, just stop. It was the worst game of hide and go seek In my life, I couldn't hide, and nothing's quiet, and I finally just stopped playing. They counted to ten, and I literally sat next to the person who was playing, and he said, you're supposed to go hide, and I said, I'm out. (laughs) It was a miserable experience. There was nowhere to go. I couldn't shake them. I couldn't get free. Good morning and welcome to Lakeside. We're glad you're here. My name is Brian. I'm part of the team and we kicked off something last week called life. And life is so many things. But last week what we saw is that all of us have a component that's going to outlast our bodies. We're all designed with part of us that that can't be seen, and it goes beyond this this physical body that, that we possess. And what we saw when we kicked off the series last week is the message of Jesus is very simply this, that if we follow Jesus, he offers us a life in which we have nothing to fear, both in this life and in what's to come. If we follow Jesus, we can live a life without fear, and we can face death without fear. That's what we saw last week. And this morning, we're going to look now at 
at this physical part that makes up our lives. So if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along with me there. It's under the events section. You can enable your GPS location, or if you're scared about the NSA and everybody else tracking your every movement, you just type in the zip code, which is 54201. Lakeside Community Church will pop up. Click on that, and then you can follow along our event. But we'll be in Psalm 139.7, and if you don't have the Bible app on your phones or on your tablets, you can follow along on the screens as we start in verse 7 this morning where we read these words, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? This song, that's what the Psalms are, they're songs. This song was written by a king, by a warrior. It was written by King David. He had an immense kingdom. Even if you're not that familiar with Scripture, you're familiar with the story of David and Goliath. It's that David. He's now grown up. He's now a king, and he's reflecting on his life, and he writes these words to God. He says, where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? He's saying, God, I can't get rid of you. There's nowhere I can go that you are not there. There is nowhere I can go where God is not. It's like trying to play hide-and-go-seek with a three-year-old, all right? Just understand that. Everywhere you go, God is. Everywhere. And so on one hand, that means we don't have to be scared about anything. Because the creator of us and the creator of the universe is every single place we could ever go. And on the other hand, that's kind of sobering when we think about it, that every single place we go and everywhere we are, the creator of us and the creator of the universe is right there. So this is incredibly freeing, and yet it's something that causes us to really, really pause And think about the vastness and the splendor and the greatness and the all-encompassing nature of God. That He is everywhere. And his mind mind is just reflecting on this. And so he continues in the next verse when he writes, If I ascend to heaven, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield, you are there. God is everywhere. And then he draws the contrast for us. Again, he draws this contrast. He says, if I go to heaven, obviously, God, there you are in in full display, in full splendor. There you are. And he draws the contrast with this place called Sheol that in the Old Testament refers to the souls of those who have died. That's where they went to rest. He says, if I go down to the grave, if I go amongst the dead, God, you're there. He's everywhere. He draws this stark contrast between the splendor of heaven and the hopelessness of those who died without hope. He says, God, you're on full display. But even when it seems you can't be found, even when it seems in the worst of worst places, God, there you are. Are. And he keeps going. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Wings in the morning, if I go everywhere or anywhere that light can be seen, every square inch of this world, anywhere I go where light can be seen, God, there you are. If I dwell at the uttermost parts of the sea, depths to which we still have not yet discovered. With all the discovery, with all the invention, if I go to the depths of the sea, the recesses to which we still have not understood, God is right there. And what's he say? You're right there guiding me. You never have to walk through life alone. In the best moments, God is right there. In the darkest moments, God is right there. You are never isolated. You are never alone. You are never beyond the reach of God. He is right there and he is available to you. No matter your circumstance, no matter your situation, no matter what you face, you are not alone. 
And you've got to really understand that. And when you understand it, grasp onto it and never let go. Because the depths are coming. They come to all of us. The disappointment happens. The isolation we feel. When the world is crumbling around us and everything is falling apart. God's right there. And you might not feel it, you might not sense it, but he hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't isolated you. You aren't alone. God is there. And the crazy thing for most of us is it's in the midst of those times where it's easier to latch on to God. than when we face the good. Because when everything's going well, when all our dreams are coming true, when everything is just firing on all cylinders and all is right in the world, we forget. And we rely on ourselves or we just remember the blessing, but we forget the one who gave it to us? The challenge for most of us isn't to reach out and to search for God and seek God when we're in the depths of the valley, when we're in despair. The challenge for most of us is to search for God and seek God when the good times are here. Nothing lasts forever. And we need God just as much when everything's great as we do when our world is falling apart. And He's right there, no matter what you're facing. Whether it's the best of times or the worst of times, God is unmoved. And he's there. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, verse 11 says, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. No matter what, no matter where, no matter the circumstances, God is there. He is there. Not only does this say something incredible about God, but this has ramifications in our existence as well. And here's why. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. The grandeur, the splendor, the vastness of God that David's just writing this song about. He can't wrap his mind fully around. He says, God, you're everywhere. is the God who's involved in our formation. In every intricate detail. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. This is the picture of an artist. This is a picture of God sitting there in painstaking detail for each and every one of us. Understand your worth. Understand your value. The God of the universe is at work in your formation. You may question your value. You may question your worth. Your life may be full of regrets, of bad decisions, of choices you wish you could make over, and choices that honestly have led you to a point that you question. What is my value? And what is my worth? How much do I matter? And this should end that turmoil for you. 
you matter so much. The God of the universe was worried about you. The God of the universe, the artist, came and he crafted you together. Don't you ever question your value. Don't you ever question your worth. I praise you, verse 14 says, for I am fearfully, wonderfully made. You bear the image of your creator. You bear the image of your creator. You are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. It's not an accident that David started this part of his song by painting a picture of the beauty of this world. It's not an accident whatsoever that he's talking about all the splendor and all the grandeur of the created world that God made and the beauty that this world has. And then he ties that in to the formation of you and I. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Again, God is everywhere and he is involved in everything your eyes saw my unformed substance and your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them let me read this again your eyes saw my unformed Substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Unformed substance, irregardless of where we are in the process, God is at work. Irregardless of where science would say, well, this is where life begins. Understand this. God is at work in every step of the process. This is why I am a champion of life without hesitation or apology. And a champion of all life. Because the story of life and the miracle of birth is a picture of God's handiwork on display in you in me, in every baby that's been conceived, in every baby that will be born, in every single person. And so without apology, I am a champion of life, of all life. But let's talk practically just for a minute what that means. I believe God's the author. We should not finish what the author has started. I believe every life has value. And so irregardless of where someone's a citizen or whether or not someone has a disability or whether or not somebody has a complication, that they are a human being made in the image of God and we need to respond and react accordingly. That all life has value and purpose. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, verse 17 says. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. The greatness of God is more than we can fathom. Understand this. The greatness of God is more than we can fathom. He is the author and designer of life. All life should be valued. And so what's that mean practically for us? 
Well, let's talk about it. First, let's make sure we're leading the charge. Let's make sure that we are leading the charge as people who understand the glory and the vastness and the greatness of God and how he is the author and creator of life. Let's make sure that we're leading the charge in supporting people who have an unplanned pregnancy. Let's make sure that we're leading the charge to be a place where people can talk and they can talk about the tough issues that they, that they feel they're facing, that they feel like they have no hope, and they have to make a choice that we would disagree with. Instead of yelling and condemnation and holding up signs, let us be a place of love and peace and understanding. Let us be people that are willing to walk alongside of people and let them know that it's not going to be an easy road, but we will support them every step of the way with the love of Jesus. We will not compromise the truth but we will be gracious and we will be merciful and we will support with every resource that we possibly have to celebrate life we will not hold up signs and picket and yell and scream and talk down to and demean but we will come alongside lovingly and say let us help you every step of the way That we be advocates for adoption and foster care. That we say every life has purpose, every life has value, every life has meaning. And we would be people on the front lines. Maybe for some of us, God has, God has called us to be foster homes. And we would just rally around that charge. And we would say, God, let us be a light and let us be an example. That maybe God's calling some of us that we would be a family that would adopt kids. And and don't misunderstand, I'm not saying God has called every family to one of these options. But we will say for those that God has called to those options, we will champion your cause. We will help support your cause. We will rally around your cause. We will celebrate the choices that you've made. We will help you every step of the way. But we will be a place that celebrates life, every life. That we would champion every life, regardless of disability or developmental issues. That we would understand the value and the worth of every single person. And those who are marginalized by society, we would not marginalize. But we would look at and we would see an image bearer of God. That we would celebrate the cause and do everything that we possibly can to assist families who are dealing with Dis- disabled children or disabled people in their family or developmentally delayed people and we would rally around their cause and say anything we can do to help because there's value and you're not going to be marginalized you're not going to be treated as a second class citizen we see the image of God and we celebrate life every life we understand the importance of every single person regardless of their country of origin or where they came from and we would welcome them that we would completely reject racism on every form in every facet because we understand that God is the author and God is the creator of life, of every life, and every person has value. Every person has worth. Everyone matters. That we celebrate life and its author and we hold it sacred. So I want to talk to you, just as your pastor, for a couple minutes. And I want you to know, if you are here and you're facing an unplanned pregnancy, we're pleading with you. We're begging you. I know it's scary. I know it's hard. And we're not going to try to minimalize all of the difficulties and all the nuances of a situation. But we just have to understand that God is the author. He's the creator. 
I want you to understand this. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to be frightened. And please, don't walk through this alone. Don't feel like there's nowhere you can turn. Don't feel like there's nowhere you can go. Don't feel like this church is going to be a place that screams at you or shouts at you or sits here and just wants to talk about judgment. Understand this is a place that wants to love you and support you and help you. Every step of the way. You do not have to walk through this alone. And I know it can be incredibly scary. But understand, you aren't alone. This is a community that's available to you. And not only that, but even more important than that, God is not turning his back on you. No matter where you go, you can't outrun God. Let's stop the political rhetoric, please. Let's just stop the political rhetoric. Because everybody wants to throw it around and everybody wants to, to minima, minimalize it and, and reduce it. And let's just, let's just stop. Let's just say, hey, that, that stuff's not going to divide us here. Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent, that, that stuff's just not, that's just not going to be what divides. We're just not going to let that divide us here. Okay? Let's just, let's just stop with the political rhetoric. Because what happens is, is one side yells, baby killers, and then the other side yells, well, you don't care about women who've been raped, or you don't care about women who've been victimized, or you don't care about women's lives that are in jeopardy, or you don't care about situations of incest. Let's just stop. Let's stop. Let's stop the political rhetoric of, well, you just let everybody cross the border for free, and, and you, don't, you don't care about whose who's dime that's on. And, and then the other side, well, you just want to throw people in cages and abuse them. Let's just stop. Let's just stop. It's great to have a, pers a, a, a political philosophy personally, and I'm not telling you how to think. I'm not telling you not to be engaged in politics, but I'm just saying if it alienates you from the person sitting next to you and from the person you live beside, we've, we've just lost sight of something that's really important. Okay? So you feel however you want to feel politically. And I'll, however you feel, I'll probably cancel one of your votes. That's cool. You'll cancel mine, all right? It's great. We just cancel each other's votes. Maybe we can turn it into a voting party. I don't know. Go get cupcakes afterwards. Be like, good luck tonight, but your vote doesn't count. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. I don't care. But let's just all take a deep breath and understand that Republicans, and, and this is going to be really hard for some of you who are Democrats to understand, Republicans are image bearers of God. Now, this is going to be really hard to understand for some of you who, who feel the other way. The Democrats are image bearers of God. That independents and people that don't care at all about politics, they definitely are image bearers of God. But let's not reduce this issue to political talking points and get mad and, and fight each other. Let's really understand something. The God we serve is a great God who is so vast we can't fully understand and we can't fully wrap our minds around. That is the greatness of God. And life is really difficult. But every life, every life matters. If you've made a decision in your life that you regret, or you've made a decision to end a pregnancy, I want you to know that you haven't made yourself so that God doesn't love you or God doesn't care about you. Just the opposite. God desperately loves you. 
And, and I say this because of statistics, it, it shows us that a, a vast number, not everybody, but a vast number of people who've made the decision to terminate a pregnancy walk through the rest of their life with feelings of remorse and guilt. And I want you to know if you're carrying those feelings, you don't have to carry those alone. The forgiveness and the grace of God is available to everyone. What we're going to do is we're going to love people. And sometimes that's really easy. And sometimes it's really not. But in the times it's not, just remember, they too are image bearers of God. They too matter. And Lakeside is a place without apology where we realize the value of every human life. From the unborn to the immigrant, to the disabled, to the isolated, to the criminal, to the person who feels alone in a nursing home who can't remember the last time a family member has come and given them a visit. Every life matters. Every single one. And as people who follow Jesus, our job is to celebrate that and to make sure we love everyone. Whether they look like us, whether they act like us, whether they like the Green Bay Packers or the Chicago Bears, our job, I'm hitting home, I know. Our job <laughs> is to love everyone. Because we all are knit together by the author and the creator. And so we all have incredible value and immense worth we all bear the image of our creator. God, help us embrace the fact there's nowhere we can go from you. Then in the best of times, and the worst of times, we are not isolated and we are not alone. Help us love each other. Help us love the people that are a lot like us. Help us love the people who are nothing like us. Help us celebrate every human life. That we at Lakeside would be champions without apology. God, I pray for the person here this morning who's struggling because they question their value and they question their worth. And I pray in the quietness of this room right now that your voice would speak to their hearts as a violent scream and you would help them know that they are loved by their creator, that they have value and they have worth. God, thank you for giving us all this gift. May we celebrate what you've done. And may we love without apology. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.